title of this lecture is Can You Take a Picture of the Soul? Okay, and I'll explain why that's the title as we go on here, okay. So the title of this lecture is Prima Fascia Absurd. Of course, you can't take a picture of the soul. When we typically talk about souls, we have in mind spiritual, ghostly persons that do not fit at all neatly into our ordinary world of physical objects. That is, we take souls, if there are such things, to be immaterial substances that cannot be possibly captured by our senses, let alone imaged by cameras. Tonight, however, my plan is to complicate the picture, uh, as it were, a great deal. In fact, at one point, I will argue that once we understand the notion of a soul as it is conceived by the Aristotelian tradition of philosophizing, there is a perfectly good sense in which you can take a picture of the soul. Moreover, with the ever-advancing technologies of functional neuroimaging, there is even a perfectly good sense in which we can video record the soul and its movements across the dimension of time. According to this Aristotelian tradition, a soul is a constituent of a living body, an organism. The soul, however, is not just any part of the organism, but one that plays a definitive role in determining the organism as being what it is. That is, the soul is an essential constituent of the organism. Thus, in observing the development of the essential structures of a certain type of organism, we are simultaneously observing, maybe even video recording, the soul of that organism. I will argue, however, that taking a picture of a mind is indeed just as absurd as it sounds. My case will not be based on the claim that minds are immaterial substances beyond the direct reach of the senses or technological means of producing images. Rather, minds are not substances at all. That is not to say that there are no minds, I think that sort of talk is self-defeating, but that there is no discrete object, whether it is a part of an organism or not, that can be identified as the mind. The main premise of this argument, as I will argue in what follows, is that there is no single event or occurrence that can be identified as the content of the mind, that is, thoughts cannot be identified with anything in particular. The idea here is that minds are no more than collections of the thoughts, psychological dispositions, and mental contents had by organisms. Since, as I will argue, thoughts cannot be identified with any discrete occurrence, they cannot be identified with any single event in the nervous system or even a series of such occurrences. This conclusion does not amount to the claim that there is therefore some immaterial organ with which the mind can be identified. That does not follow at all, although such a hasty inference has often been made. Rather, the claim is that minds are not the sorts of things that can be neatly identified with any particular thing. The non-particularity or insubstantiality of minds is no strike against the reality, as indeed being is said in many ways, but only indicates that minds are not particulars or substantial beings. We do not get, uh, pardon me, we do not get, uh, pardon me, what we do get for our steep investment in the metaphysics and philosophy of mind that follows is, is pretty rich. I believe that our efforts will be rewarded with two important theses. First, if the soul is something that can be pictured in as much as we can picture the definitive structures and collective processes of the human organism, then sciences which are able to study organisms through such imaging are indeed capable of studying the human soul. Specifically, the neurosciences, through the use of various electromagnetic and radiographic imaging techniques, are, by taking pictures of the human nervous system, at the same time rendering images of the operations of the human soul. The fact that the human soul, as many of us would argue, is transcendent of all matter in some sense, makes no difference. The neurosciences are picturing and illuminating the operations of the essential component of what it is to be human. Neuroscience is the most direct science of the soul, even though we might include all the biological disciplines under that moniker. Secondly, nevertheless, since the human mind, which partially emerges from the human nervous system, cannot be identified with anything captured in such picturing, it follows that no matter how successful we are at mapping the human organism, brain and soul alike, we will not have exhaustively explained the human mind. Having a mind is much more complicated, happily so, than anything that can ever be shown in an image. The upshot is that other ways of approaching mindedness enjoy a certain autonomy from the neurosciences. There is more than one true story to be told about the human being and her thinking. Taking the human case, having a human soul is a necessary condition for having a human mind. 
Having a human soul, however, is not the very same thing as having a human mind. In fact, one can have a human soul while failing to have a mind at all. At early stages of our, of our development, all of us had human souls without yet having achieved our minds. Neuroscience, as the most direct science of the human soul, is a necessary part of our understanding of what it is to have a human mind because minds have souls as necessary conditions. That is, we cannot understand the human mind without understanding the soul as it is embodied in the human organism. Yet, what neuroscience has to show us does not exhaust what there is to know about the human mind because having a mind has other elements external to the organism as necessary conditions. At the very least, that is what I hope to show in what follows. Can the mind be pictured? A recent edition of a very popular introductory psychology textbook refers to a set of images produced by various brain scanning devices as, quote, windows on the mind. And this caption appears within a section under the title, Windows on the Brain. The implicit idea here seems to be that these images are windows on the mind because the mind and the brain are just the very same thing, the same object. The supposed picture of the mind is also a picture of a brain, so the caption that glosses it entails that taking a picture of a mind is the same as taking a picture of a certain organism engaged in a certain activity. In this case, an active human brain. That is, a mind is the sort of thing that can be captured in a discrete image, what I'll just call a picture, because the mind just is the brain, and we can, and we can certainly take images of the brain. In fairness to the authors, no such claim is explicitly made in the text, but at the same time, this mind-brain identity thesis is likely how students reading the book will interpret the captions. In fact, the authors claim earlier in the text that, quote, modern biological psychologists have, have rejoined mind and body uh, and now view the mind as the product of the brain. Talk like the mind is the product of the brain and the mind is based on the brain suffuses these sorts of discussions. But it is ambiguous. For example, is the product of and is based on are not the same as, identical to, or is the very same thing as. So which do the authors mean? I take it the latter because it is fairly typical to presume among secular intellectuals that, that once all the facts in are, are in about the brain, so will all the facts be in about the mind. Notice, however, that the claim implicit in the caption is ambiguous. Does the caption mean that every case of taking a picture of a mind is a case of taking a picture of an active brain? Does it mean that every case of taking a picture of an active brain, at least in the act activity pictured in the textbook, is, like is likewise taking a picture of a mind? I'm not quite sure how to sort those questions out for the authors. So let's operate under the following modest and charitable supposition. The caption claims that taking a picture of an active brain of a certain sort is sufficient for taking a picture of a mind. I, can, I, can I take it that this supposition entails this further claim. Being an active brain of a certain sort is sufficient for being a mind. Maybe there are brains that are not minds, but any brain that is operating in a certain way is a mind, it seems. I think that it, that is fair as far as it goes. In this way, we are not ascribing to the caption any stronger thesis about the relationship between minds and brains than is absolutely necessary. For future reference, let's tighten this up a bit. Let's suppose that the state of the mind supposedly in the picture is thinking about Paris. Let's further suppose that the state of the brain in the picture is, just to give it a name, Zeta. Of course, what I'm calling Zeta, the state of the brain in the, in the MRI in the textbook, in reality may have nothing whatsoever to do with thinking about Paris. But let's just roll with this as an example. Thus, the author's claim is that a brain's being in Zeta is sufficient condition for a mind's being in a state of thinking about Paris. In what follows, I will argue that, brains, that the brain's being in Zeta is indeed insufficient for the mind's being in a state of thinking about Paris. That is, a picture of Zeta is not a picture of thinking about Paris. Thus, since, picturing, uh, since picture thinking is not the same as, as pardon me, since Picturing thinking is not the same as picturing an activity of a brain. Pictures of brains are not pictures of minds. There might be a part whole fallacy in this vicinity, but I'm confident I can assuage that worry in our discussion later if need be. Before we get down to that argument, one more clarification is probably necessary. 
What do we mean by all this talk of sufficient condition? I'm sure you know what sufficient means in common English, but, there is, but here it's being used in a sort of technical philosophical sense. In this context, when we say that X is sufficient condition for Y, what we mean is that any occurrence of X is likewise an occurrence of Y. Another way this is often put is that X necessitates Y, or Y supervenes on X. Whatever way you put it, the idea is that there is no way the world could be such that X is there and Y is not. If things stood different with respect to Y, then they would have to have stood differently with respect to X. The way this is most often thought about by recent philosophers is, is, that if, is that if Y supervenes on X, then every case of X just is a case of Y. Being X just is to be Y. For example, we might say that in order for something to be a statue of Dumbledore the wizard, it is sufficient that it be clay in a certain configuration. In such a case, we would not say that being a statue of Dumbledore, pardon me, in such a case, we would say that being a statue of Dumbledore supervenes on being this configuration of clay. Notice that there certainly could be statues of Dumbledore that are not configurations of clay, let alone this configuration of clay. For example, the statue could be chiseled from marble. So we would not say that being a statue of Dumbledore is identical to being this configuration of clay. Nevertheless, this statue of Dumbledore just is this configured clay. And there's nothing else necessary for its being a statue of Dumbledore than it be this configuration of clay. In what follows, we will refer to this relationship as supervenience, such that being the statue of Dumbledore, statue of Dumbledore supervenes on being this configuration of clay. Notice that if this statue of Dumbledore supervenes on this configuration of clay, then taking a picture of the configured clay is likewise taking a picture of a statue of Dumbledore. To return then to our main question, does thinking about Paris supervene on Zeta? All right. Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, a very important 20th century philosopher, argues that we should, we should answer questions like this negatively. That is, thinking about Paris does not supervene on Zeta. To quote Wittgenstein, no supposition seems to me more natural than that there is no process in the brain correlated with associating or thinking so that it would be impossible to read off the thought process from the brain processes, end quote. Don't be too hasty. As Wittgenstein is not denying a correlation in a, in a more stricter sense between expressions of thought and processes in the brain. To quote Wittgenstein again, if I talk or write, there is, I assume, a system of impulses going out from my brain and correlated with my spoken or written thoughts, end quote. Taking our example, Wittgenstein does not doubt, and in fact he assumes, that any expression of thinking about Paris will be correlated with an occurrence of Zeta. I also see no reason for Wittgenstein to deny that this correlation might be retrospective. For example, if we saw Patrick's brain was in Zeta two minutes ago, when we asked him, what were you thinking about a couple minutes back, we should expect him to say, I was thinking about Paris. Nevertheless, Wittgenstein maintains that it is impossible uh, to read off thinking of Paris from Zeta, to use our example. He makes this case with the following rather odd thought experiment, quoting Wittgenstein. The case would be like the following. Certain kinds of plants multiply by seed, so that a seed always produces a plant of the same kind as that from which it was produced. But nothing in the seed corresponds to the plant which, which comes from it so that it is impossible to infer the properties or structure of the plant from those of the seed that it comes out of. This can only be done by the history of the seed. So an organism might come into being even out of, the some, out of something quite amorphous, as if, as if causelessly. There is no reason why this should not hold for our thoughts and hence for our thinking and writing." End quote. Wittgenstein's proposal is strange, but intelligible. He supposes that we might be aware of a sort of relationship between a plant and a certain type of seed, such that any case in which such a seed is appropriately nourished, we would expect that type of plant to occur. Thus, there is a sense in which the seed is sufficient condition for the plant. That is, the proper occurrence of the seed is predictively enough for the occurrence of the plant. 
all we would have to know about the world in order to predict that such a plant will show up is that such a seed was appro appropriately situated. In Wittgenstein's example, however, there is nothing about the properties or structure of the seed that sheds any light on the properties or structures of the plant. It is simply an unexplained fact that these seeds have so far, as have so far always preceded these plants. There is nothing about the intrinsic nature of the seeds that leads us connect to connect it with the plant. We make that connection only based on what we know about the history of the seeds. We've seen this happen. All we've ever needed to do in order to bring about these plants is to plant these seeds. That is why Wittgenstein claims that the plant comes to about causelessly, even though the seed is predictively sufficient for it. The seed predicts, maybe even infallibly, the occurrence of the plant, but it does not explain the structure and properties of the plant. Thus, even though the seed is a predictively sufficient condition for the plant, the plant does not supervene on the seed. This plant is not just this seed, as there are properties that the plant has that the seed lacks, and there's no intrinsic connection between these properties and any properties in the seed. Taking a picture of a seed in this case would not be the very same act as taking a picture of the corresponding plant. Supposing this example is intelligible, and I believe it is, Wittgenstein connects it to the, our current concern regarding the mind-brain supervenience thesis. It is thus perfectly possible that certain psychological phenomena cannot be investigated physiologically because physiologically nothing corresponds to them. That was a quote from Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein claims that something like Zeta is an analog to the seed and thinking about Paris is an analog to the plant. He doesn't doubt that an occurrence of Zeta is predictively sufficient for an occurrence of thinking about Paris. Wittgenstein nevertheless claims that nothing corresponds in Zeta to thinking about Paris. Given the history of Zeta type states, we might be able to say that knowing that Zeta occurs is alone enough to expect thinking about Paris is occurring, but nothing in the intrinsic character of Zeta is at all connected to the content or information contained in the intrinsic character of Zeta. Uh, Oh, pardon me. Not, there's, uh, nothing is intrinsic in the intrinsic character of Zeta is at all connected to the content or information contained in an occurrence of thinking about Paris. Ultimately, Zeta is just a network of electric, electrical impulses moving along highly structured membrane, membranes, and none of that has any bearing on the content of thinking about Paris. One might say that Zeta, Zeta occurs in regions of the brain associated with this sort of thinking, but that just seems to beg the question against Wittgenstein's point. The only reason to know to correlate those regions with, the, with those kinds of thinking is based on the history, not their internal character. It is all just impulses along mem membranes that have nothing whatsoever to do with the content of the mental states. Okay, fair enough. But an obvious objection looms. Certainly we might have only a non-explanatory correlation from a cer certain seed types to certain plant types. But that could just be uh, reflective of our currently limited understanding of these seeds and those plants, and not an ontologically significant difference between the two. Maybe with further investigation, we will come to understand that there is indeed an intrinsic connection between the structures and properties of these seeds and plants, such that we can say there is something analogous to the supervenience relationship in play here. I agree that Wittgenstein's example is weak in this way. But I also think its weakness is considerably mitigated when we consider the Zeta and thinking about Paris case. Even if we do not know what connects seeds and plants yet, it is perfectly plausible that we eventually would make such a discovery. At least we conceive, we can conceive of what a discovery would look like, right, based on other cases of botanical progress in the past. What, however, would it even be like to discover the nature of an intrinsic connection between Zeta and thinking about Paris? What could, what could impulses across membranes or even systems of such uh, impulses across membranes or systems of systems of systems have to do with the content of a thought? There is already much in common between seeds and plants such that it pays to hold out for an answer. When it comes to Zeta and thinking about Paris, it seems we have arrived at the ultimate apples versus oranges situation, or at least so many philosophers have claimed. Though I think there is much traction to this reply, an appeal to intractable ignorance leaves this philosopher feeling a bit uncomfortable. The following thought experiment makes a much stronger case. 
Like any thought experiment, it's a piece of just so science fiction built entirely on conjecture about, about things uh, we haven't done yet, maybe never will, but it is plausible enough to reveal our most reasonable intuitions in this area. Suppose a brain scientist, let's call him Michael, is able to clone a living adult human brain. Further suppose that Michael is able to stimulate this brain directly such that it exhibits an occurrence of Zeta. The brain is not embedded in an organism that has traveled to Paris, nor seen a picture of Paris, read a book about Paris. Michael just directly produces the seed of thinking about Paris by electromagnetic stimulation. Does that brain thereby have an occurrence of thinking about Paris? I find it hard to believe someone can seriously answer this question affirmatively. There is no intrinsic connection between Zeta and Paris, such, such that if Paris had never existed, an occurrence of Zeta would leave a brain thinking about a fictional city where there is a fictional Eiffel Tower. Are we to believe that evolution has left an intrinsic connection between Zeta uh, and, and an eternal essence of a city that may or may not have ever existed in the concrete? Are we, are we to suppose that a caveman who accidentally had an occurrence of Zeta, say by a blow to the head, would have had a thought about Paris before Paris even existed? I could keep piling on, but suffice it to say that it is hard to take seriously that an occurrence of Zeta really is sufficient for an occurrence of thinking about Paris. Maybe I'm being too simplistic. Maybe Michael also stimulates a cloned brain to have corresponding occurrences of brain processes associated with the Count of Monte Cristo seeing photos of the Eiffel Tower, or memories of various museums. Might we not then say that an occurrence of Zeta in the clone brain is eligible to be an instance of thinking about Paris? Not really, because the proposal just kicks the can down the proverbial road. Would a caveman who accidentally had the set of brain processes associated in our brains with the Count of Monte Cristo then have inklings of Edmond Dante's millennia before Dumas even conceived of this character? Once again, that seems pretty extravagant. It seems then what, that Wittgenstein is correct. An occurrence of Zeta is insufficient for the occurrence of thinking about Paris. Indeed, if we take our thought experiment seriously, we might even say that Zeta isn't even predictively sufficient for thinking about Paris. In our thought experiment, Michael was able to produce an occurrence of Zeta without producing an occurrence of thinking about Paris. Thus, thinking about Paris does not supervene on Zeta even in some weaker sense. Since as we discussed earlier, we would say that one can picture thinking about Paris by picturing Zeta only if thinking about Paris supervenes on Zeta, uh, we, we should now conclude that we cannot picture thinking about Paris by picturing Zeta. Since minds are only collections of mental states like thinking about Paris, it follows that we cannot picture minds by picturing processes in brains. There are two ways one might easily make too much of the conclusion we have reached. We have shown that minds are not supervening on brains and maybe even that the latter aren't even predictably sufficient for the former. That, however, is not to say that certain brain states are not necessary conditions for correlated mental states, nor that brains uh, are not necessary conditions for minds. In short, one can accept all that we have argued thus far while accepting a, a, an if no brain, no mind thesis. Indeed, much of what we know about the world, both through science and common sense, should encourage us to accept just such a thesis. Furthermore, I have not argued to the effect that mental states should be identified with non-physical processes internal to a mind, which is itself identified as a sort of non-physical organ or substance that parallels the operations of the brain. Wittgenstein himself is very quick to point out that the fact that a thought is not a, process, not a physical process internal to an individual thinker a process in the brain, does not imply that a thought is therefore a non-physical process internal to, to the thinker, a process in a sort of immaterial organ, a mind taken as a substance. It would be quite odd to claim that an immaterial mind that acts as the ground for an instance of thinking about Paris would have such a thought uh, even though Paris had never existed, etc. It is no less absurd to say an immaterial mind is thinking about Paris as an essential feature than it is to say that much about a brain. Rather, maybe a thought isn't a process internal to the thinker at all, either physical or non-physical. Whether it is taken to occur in a physical or non-physical medium, to have a thought about Paris requires that the thinker be related to Paris in some way, in some very definite way at that. The relation will require much more than just factors internal to the thinker in Paris. 
uh, in our case, the history of the human organism must have gone down a particular path, uh, which it might not have traveled. Assuming that thoughts are not really separated from their linguistic expression, the history of the English language, and the French language for that matter, uh, is a necessary condition for this thought. While, while we're at it, it seems that all sorts of cultural, psychological, and sociological factors must also be taken into account if we are to understand the story of what it is to think about Paris in any one instance. Thus, what it is to think about Paris is ultimately not just something internal to the thinker, but something that arises as the interplay between the thinker, the physiology of the species, his, historical and cultural factors, etc., etc. If we are going to say that a thought supervenes on anything, uh, we would have to say that it has, has, its, has as its sufficient condition an entire world as it, uh, and its prior history. John Hoglund makes much the same point when he says, intelligence itself abides out in the world, not just inside, end quote. We inherit, we are born into a universe of conceptual, material, emotional, and practical involvements which always predate our arrival and which are all, we always share with others. It is our being thrown into such a world that accounts for the content of our thoughts. That shared world is the place where thought occurs. It is not so much that thoughts occupy our mental space, brains or even individuated mental substances, but that we occupy a world rife with thought. Again with Hoglund, quote, the, meaning, the meaningful is not our mind or our brain, but instead something worldly. And we do not store the meaningful inside ourselves, but rather live in it and are at home in it. The meaningful is the world itself, end quote. Hoglund is not endorsing a sort of idealism according to which the world is some mental projection by a prior existing mind. Indeed, that is exactly what is being recommended against. Mind is a participation in a world where a world is not merely a collection of physical things, but also a network of meaningful relations med mediated to us through our shared skills, emotional concerns, and conceptual schemes that are constantly beholden to those concrete physical objects. Think of the world here not merely as the sum total of entities individuated in time and space, as in, as in uh, the world came into being with the Big Bang, but as the totality of things that make sense to us, that are meaningful to us, as in, I might say, Meeting Jennifer in 1998 rocked my world forever. It is, not, it is our participation in such a meaningful world that we receive thought and become practitioners of mind. If we are to indulge similes, we would do better to say that being a rational animal is more like being an antenna than it is like being a projector. Appeals to the occurrence of the world are hardly explanatory. So we are left to think of thought as something that will ultimately defy any sort of neat explanation in some more fundamental category. That's not to say that thought is something spooky or supernatural. We can study it through all the disciplines I've mentioned above, but none of them will result in a complete explanation. And there is no way to pull them together into a non-trivial summative account. None of our pictures ever really captures thought. Okay. So, so much for minds. I want to talk about souls now. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, what is a soul? Picturing mind is now, I hope, out of the question for us. But I, but I, I promised you an argument to the effect that souls can indeed be pictured. So what do I mean by a soul? It should be clear that I don't take souls to be minds. Uh, but that doesn't say a whole lot. Aristotle design, defines soul as, quote, the first actualization of a natural body that has life potentially, end quote. What, what that means is a long story to tell, but let's begin by considering the podium from which I am reading this lecture, which of course is a desk, but go with me on that, okay. Um, where did I go there? Uh, okay, it is a comp composition of material parts, boards, screws, bits of glue, etc. Notice, however, that the desk is not identical to that collection of material parts. Uh, though the desk is located in the very same place as that collection, and touching it would involve touching that collection, uh, they are not the very same thing. I realize, realize that this is an odd claim when whispered in the ear to, of the person on the street. What else would a desk be but just a collection of boards, screws, glue bits, etc.? 
Well, it is not as silly as it first sounds. If two things are identical, then, then each of their existence should be sufficient for the existence of the other. If Jim Madden and the guy giving you this lecture are one and the same being, uh, then there had better not be conditions under which uh, the one exists without the latter. Now, to make that stick, we need to get very clear about what the guy giving this lecture designates, right, and how it designates, but afford me just that one promissory note and trust that such an account can be given. All right, if they could exist separately, then they, then, uh, they just are not the very same thing. Now, if we smashed the desk with a sledgehammer, such that we are left only with a pile of broken boards, screws, etc., we would likely conclude that the desk has passed away while the parts have clearly persisted. Thus, there's a, there's a sort of unity or identity that the desk possesses that is not possessed by its parts because the very same collection of parts can exist as it does now composing a podium and it could likewise exist as not composing a podium after we have smashed the podium to bits. Technically, we should say that the podium possesses a synchronic unity that is lacked by the mere occurrence of the collection of its parts. That is, the podium is right now a unified whole that is distinct from its parts. So we cannot say that the podium even supervenes on the parts as such, since there are cases in which the parts occur without any podium. Moreover, if we replace just one screw in the podium or desk, we would not feel as though we had destroyed the rightful property of Benedictine College. Indeed, if we did so incrementally, we might even change out every piece of the desk without ever having the sense of having lost the original desk. Thus, whereas we saw earlier that the parts exist without the, the desk, we can see here that the podium could in some sense exist without the parts, supposing they are replaced incrementally. The desk then has what goes by the name of a dichronic unity over and above the collection of its parts. It can persist over stretches of time throughout which its current, its current parts do not. In short, we know that the desk or the podium is not strictly identical to its parts because it possesses a synchronic and diachronic unity distinct from the collection of those parts. Notice that the podium enjoys, at least for our ordinary common sense, a sort of ontological priority over its parts. If you ask me to count the objects in this room, and I stopped and counted for each part of my desk, but I did not count for the desk itself, or I counted the parts uh, and the podium separately, uh, you would find that sorting rather odd. Rather, we would all expect just to count the desk. Uh, the most important fact is the being of the desk, not its, part, not its parts. In other words, the desk occupies a more prominent place in our ontology than do its parts. The foregoing, should motivate the conclusion that the podium, though it is coextensive at the moment with its set of parts, is not identical to those parts. The podium is a composition of the parts and something else. The notion that these, uh, the notion that these curious facts about the podium can be generalized so as to apply to all material objects is the ancient Aristotelian doctrine of hylomorphism. The hylomorphist claims that all material objects, at least those that can be divided into parts, are composed of matter a set of parts that have a potency to compose an object of that kind. As an, and an additional principle, what is called the form, that accounts for the actuality of such a composition. Notice that the form is not a part in the, sense, in the same sense as the things we find in the matter. What is the difference between a pile of podium parts and a podium? It is the being able that must be present in order for those parts to perform the function of a podium. It's not just the capacity to do the podium activity in the broadest sense, the parts have that, we can make a podium out of them, but the ready disposition to do it without further change, uh, which we, we only find in an actual podium. The podium is poised to perform the podium function in a way that the parts are not taken outside of their composition. It is this being poised to perform that Aristotelians are referring to with talk of the form of an object. The form is not just one more part, but an active, an active potency, sometimes Aristotle calls it, or a first actuality. The parts come to have in virtue of their composing the whole. The object is a composition of its matter and this being able, the form, that distinguishes it from the matter. As I have said above, 
the hylomorphous claims that this account in terms of form matter composition can be generalized to cover all material objects. This generalization includes not just artifacts such as podiums and desks, but living beings too. Take a cat, let's call him Fluffy. Is Fluffy identical to his material parts? No more than is a piece of furniture. The fact that Fluffy can have all order of unfortunate accidents that would leave us with the complete collection of unassembled cat parts, but no cat, shows that Fluffy has a synchronic unity distinct from his parts. Moreover, the fact that Fluffy is constantly exchanging matter with his environment throughout his lifespan show that, shows that he has a diachronic unity distinct from his aggregated parts at any one moment. Like, the, like a piece of furniture, Fluffy has an ontological precedent over his parts, but in a much more profound way. Above the molecular level, Fluffy's parts have no stability of their own once separated from Fluffy. The organs, tissues, cells, etc., that compose Fluffy will die and decompose once they're separated from Fluffy. The being of these parts presupposes the completed whole of the cat, or some outside causality to keep them alive artificially. If we, if we ask why such parts as livers, muscle cells, etc., exist, it will be very difficult to answer such questions without appeal to whole organisms to which they belong. Even at the molecular level, atomic or subatomic level, uh, we cannot explain uh, to any great level of satisfaction why they are assembled in the way they are without appealing to the functional role they play in the living organism, even though they can exist outside such a composition. Moreover, there are, there are ways in which even these most fundamental constituents behave differently when they are composed in, or excuse me, they are compounded in organisms. Thus, Fluffy enjoys an explanatory and ontological precedent of a sort over his parts. We conclude then that Fluffy is a composite of form and matter for reasons similar to those that led us to the same conclusion with respect to artifacts, such as the desk. Notice, however, that the case is even stronger for Fluffy than for a piece of furniture. Though the desk enjoys a sort of precedent over its parts, there's also a sense in which nothing really novel comes into existence with the coming to be of the first desk. The desk has no capacities that are not straightforwardly capacities of, solid of the solidity of the wood composing it. Becoming a desk is a refinement of wood, uh, but it's really just another accidental way of being wood. The changes the podium suffers under its, uh, the desk suffers under its own steam really just are changes of the wood. Fluffy, however, is different. Fluffy engages in activities and has powers that are unprecedented in his parts. Cats, along with all living things, undergo changes that are utterly novel compared to the, their parts at all levels of analysis. Cats push back against the world in ways that are sui generis compared to the capacities of their parts. That is not to say that there is some mystery as to how those components give rise to those powers, but they do amount to something new under the sun. For this reason, we might say that the coming to be of a cat is the occurrence of a new substance, not merely an accident of its parts. Thus, Aristotelians have long said that a living thing is a composite, not just of a form and matter, but a soul and matter. Here, all that is meant by soul is the form of a living thing. That is, the distinctive being able that marks the difference between its composing matter and the living substance that is so composed. Aristotle famously used an analogy between an eyeball and a living organism to explain this point. By analogy, the soul of the eye would be sight. By sight, we don't mean actually seeing something. A closed eye is still an eye. But the being poised to see that we only find in a living eye, as opposed to a decomposing set of eye parts detached from the organism. Being able to see is the actuality of being an eye, and it has ontological and explanatory precedent over the parts of the eye. They exist and are what they are because of their role in the function of the eye. Leaving aside the analogy, eyes are not living substances, but parts living substances, Aristotle would say that the soul of the cat is the, is the being able right, to engage in cat actions that distinguishes Fluffy from his composing parts, and other kinds of things those parts at finer levels of decomposition might have composed. Thus, the Aristotelian hylomorphus sees nature as rich with souls. All living things are, are compounds of souls and material parts. That is no trivial claim. Hylomorphism of this sort, and there are other versions, 
uh, has profound philosophical ramifications as it rules out any kind of strict reduction of organisms to their constituents. Organisms are not just collections ultimately of subatomic particles. Rather, nature is suffused with emergent entities, living things, which cannot be understood solely in terms of their constituents, but must be seen in light of their definitive po being poised to act, their souls. In fact, Aristotle himself thought that the soul is the object of proper scientific study, at least for the life sciences. The distinctive being able of kinds of living things is what the biologist ultim is ultimately out to understand and explain. Of course, to the ear of supposedly hard-nosed reductive science scientists, this talk sounds fishy, but the recent progress in systems approaches to biological explanation has gone some way to vindicate something akin to the Aristotelian conception of nature as full of souls, though that's a difficult way to put it, right? Uh, at the same time, we must be careful not to make too much out of this talk of souls. In fact, I all, often wish we had a different word. When we hear soul today, we think of ghosts, substantial minds, our truest selves, angels, or what have you. That is, we think of a soul as a kind of substance that interacts with a body in, a, in the way a virus is a substance that interacts with an organism. Notice, however, that the hylomorphous means no such thing by soul. The soul is not a substance, but the definitive being able of a substance. We also need, we tend to use the word soul in ways that primarily associate it with consciousness or otherwise psychological attributes. The soul is a thinking substance, so famously claimed by Descartes, or the bearer of my psychological as opposed to my, my merely physical properties, one might say. Notice, however, that the Aristotelian path to the soul does not run through consciousness or psychological attribution at all. The soul is posited to solve problems about the identity and unity of complex living things. And there are plenty of non-conscious things that have souls. Aristotle would count plants as things with souls. When the Aristotelian claims that even plants have souls, that is not because they believe there are ghosts or minds inhabiting trees. It is just to say that there is a definitive being able of the tree that marks it as something over and above the aggregate of its parts. Of course, in some living things, the definitive being able is, is a realized capacity for certain conscious or psychological activities. Certainly, part of being a cat is being poised to hunt certain types of prey, respond to injury, pursue particular mates, etc. All of these activities, definitive of being a cat, are hard to envision without the cat being conscious of its environment. Thus, Fluffy's soul is in part a being able to engage in particularly feline consciousness of the world. This is not at all to say that Fluffy's soul engages in such consciousness. Rather, it is Fluffy that engages in this distinctively feline consciousness. Fluffy's soul is the being able to engage in such activity. But it is Fluffy, as a biological whole, that so engages. Or, or at the very least, hylomorphism is consistent with such an emergentist or holistic view of consciousness. Finally, hylomorphism extends its account to human beings. That is, a human being is not identical to the aggregates of her parts because she possesses a synchronic and diachronic unity over and above those parts, and she enjoys an ontological and explanatory precedent over those parts. In other words, a human being is a hylomorphic compound of matter and form. Moreover, since a human being is a living thing, a substance novel as compared to its composing parts, it is a composite of matter uh, and that special sort of form Aristotle calls a soul. Notice, however, that none of this is to say anything particularly interesting about human beings as such, but simply to include human nature in a generalized Aristotelian account of nature. There is nothing special, according to the Aristotelian, about our having souls. That does not answer the question of whether there is anything special about the souls we do have, and that's a different kind of question. Okay. All right, now, kind of the punchline. Can you take a picture of a soul? All right. Notice that for Aristotle, the soul of a living thing is not an additional part supplementing its matter. Rather, the soul is the active ability to exercise the powers requisite of such a living thing. As Andrea Kern puts it, the soul is, quote, a form of a living being. It is that which answers the question, what is it by virtue of which this is a living being, end quote. The answer to that question is, uh, will vary from one type of organism to another, as the activities that constitute its form of life will vary uh, according to its kind. 
Thus, the human soul, for example, is just whatever counts for this configure of ma- configuration of matter to actually be a living human being instead of something else. Now, in light of all that, consider the following dense remarks from Aristotle. Okay? These bodily parts, then, are in a way prior to the compound, but in a way not, since they cannot exist when they are separated. For it is not a finger in any in every state that is a finger of an animal, rather a dead finger is only homonymously a finger. Some of these parts, however, are simultaneous, namely the ones that are controlling and in which the account and substance are first found, for example, the heart, perhaps, or the brain, for it makes no difference which of them is of that sort, end quote. That's really compact, and I expect that was nearly unintelligible, <laughs> okay. Um, but let's unpack it, all right. Take your, take your run-of-the-mill body part, a finger. There is no sense in which a finger is prior to the organism as a whole, according to Aristotle, right? Um, because the finger, as being a finger, depends on the compound for its being. Separate the finger and it begins to disintegrate, right? So if you cut my finger off, it will immediately begin to disintegrate as a finger, okay? Unless you artificially intervene, okay? In this passage, Aristotle is stopping us from generalizing that claim to the claim that all parts of an organism are inseparable from the organism. He claims that some parts are, as he puts it, a simultaneous with the organism as a whole, because B, they are controlling, and, in, uh, and that in which C account uh, for the substance uh, of that thing first found. Okay. His examples are D, maybe the heart and maybe the brain are these kinds of parts. All right, let's unpack what he means by all of that. As, for, as, for simul, as far as simultaneous goes, there's some rather quaint ancient embryology in play here, but I think in principle we can see that Aristotle is not far off the mark. We don't just pop into existence with the full component of our human organs. The organ, organism comes online incrementally. Whatever the first part of the organism is, that part in the organism as a whole came to be simultaneously. So if the liver were the first part of the human organism, then the liver and the organism came to be at the same instant. So there was a time when a liver then would have been sufficient for being a human. In a sense, then the liver would be separable from the rest of the organism, right? The rest of the subsequent parts, because it did indeed exist separately from them uh, in, in the process of gestation. Thus, there is a sense in which some parts of the organism are separable from the whole. Now, notice that the special relationship, uh, using our rather silly example, between the liver, uh, the liver and the soul. At that early point of development, the actualization of the organism was nothing more than the liver. In those circumstances, the being able of that organism would be no more than the functioning of the liver. Right? To see the organism at work would be to see the liver doing the liver thing. There's a sense then in which we could say at one point in development, the soul was the very same thing as the liver, okay? Now Aristotle starts to lay out some conditions for being parts that are simultaneous with the whole. The first he mentions is control. That is, some parts play a special role in directing the rest of the organism's activity and development. Aristotle thinks that certain parts of the organism have a governing function of the rest of the organism. Aristotle is not committed to the notion that the controlling parts come online literally first in fetal development. His candidates for controlling part are the heart or the brain. On his view of embryology, the newly formed organism goes through a vegetative or non-animal uh, organism stage, a non-human animal stage, and a human stage of development. I take it that a controlling part need only, be, need only come online at the onset of the development of its distinctive stage. Uh, and I take it that these controlling parts will be running the show for the organism for its entire lifespan thereafter. Aristotle then tells us that, quote, uh, the account and substance are first found, end quote, in these controlling parts, which I'm taking as the same as the simultaneous parts. In other words, as soon as the controlling parts come online, we have something fitting the definition of this kind of organism. The controlling parts, because they are sufficient for the coming to be of the organism, are themselves the places in which the soul is first and primarily located. That is, simultaneous parts are those that most distinctively mark the coming to be of an organism of a certain kind. 
uh, that is, a simultaneous part must be the locale of the most distinctive activities of that organism. Notice that Aristotle actually thinks that the soul can be spatially located then. The soul as the substance of the organism is first found in the controlling parts. Those controlling parts maintain their governing role throughout the life of the organism, so it will always be the case that, in some sense, the governing parts of the organism are there with the controlling parts, even if, in another sense, Aristotle thinks the soul somehow suffuses the body. Think of it this way. A soul is the first actuality of a living organism, but it acts as such by first being the first actuality of the controlling parts. Certainly, without the controlling parts, the organism will cease to be integrated. It'll die. So there is a sense in which the controlling parts have an actualizing role with respect to the rest of the parts. Notice that the liver is certainly not a si simultaneous or controlling part. That was just my easy example. It doesn't control the whole of the organism, and it isn't the location of the distinctive activity of any animal. Aristotle mentions the heart and the brain as possibilities. I think the perhaps that he puts in that sentence is a sign that the heart is not his preferred hypothesis. I don't think it matters whether the heart or the brain literally come first in embryonic development, but which makes the coming to be of an organ, which marks the coming to be of an organ with a governing power over the organism as a whole. Given what we know now, the brain is obviously the controlling part of the human organism, or any organism with a brain for that matter. There is a sense in which the brain as a controlling or simultaneous part is the actualization of the, uh, uh, is the actualization of the initial actualization of the organism. That is, to put it maybe a bit too simplistically, there's a sense in which the brain is the place of the soul more distinctively than any other part. Thus, as neuroscientists become more adept at producing functional neural images, uh, they are not merely taking pictures of a physical object. Rather, these neuroscientists are rendering images of the human soul captured in its activities and yielding to us insight into our nature and conditions of our flourishing. That is not to say that neuroscience will ever exhaust what there is to wonder about about ourselves. As I have argued earlier, mind is something that can fit into any picture, and it will, pardon me, mind is something that cannot fit into any picture, and it will forever be a moving target. Soul, however, is something about which we can indeed have a science. As Wittgenstein puts it, the human body is the best picture of the human soul. All right, thank you.